Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and we'll get into our study. Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us today. May we come to an understanding of what the message is to Laodicea. May we accept that message and may we move forward in faith to receive the latter rain and the loud cry. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So, just as a point of clarification, it sounds like <clears throat> I made a statement at one point where, um, where I said that Jones and Wagner were teaching that the law was the ceremonial law and it confused a couple of people. Let me be clear. Jones and Wagner taught all the way through that the law in Galatians was the Ten Commandments. And, um, and so that, I'm sorry that I misspoke there. And at the other point in history that I didn't mention um, is that Ellen White in the 1890s received light from the Lord that the law in Galatians was both the ceremonial and the moral law. So they were both right and they were both wrong. So Wagner and Jones helped to bring out more clearly um, the element of justification by faith from Galatians, but they didn't take into consideration how the ceremonial law was part of the added law that helped people in the Old Testament to come to Christ. Okay, <clears throat> so this is 1888 and the Laodicean message. Um, let's get right into this. Notice what Ellen White says. This is the 1888 Materials, page 1052. She says, The message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church, and woe be unto anyone who professes to believe the truth and yet does not reflect to others the God-given rays. And then she goes on to say, Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. And then she says, Faith I live by, by page 111. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So look, we must see our own nothingness. We have nothing to bring to the table when it comes to righteousness. We must see that we are the Laodicean people. And when we see our nothingness, then we can receive the righteousness of Christ and we will heed the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean church. Notice also what Jones and Wagner um, said, just a few snippets um, of what they said in their teachings. Jones says, When Jesus comes, it is to take his people unto himself. It is to pre present to himself his glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it is holy and without blemish. It is to see himself perfectly reflected in all his saints, and before he comes thus, his people must be in that condition. And this state of perfection, this developing in each believer, the complete image of Jesus. This is the finishing of the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This consummation is accomplished in the cleansing of the sanctuary. So that's pretty clear. Jones is saying we'll have a people just like Jesus when he comes. Um, he also says, this special message of justification which God has been sending us is to prepare us for glorification at the coming of the Lord. In this, God is giving to us the strongest sign that it is possible for him to give that the next thing is the coming of the Lord. Um, and there's other things, there's other quotes that I could make, but let me just um, quote one other statement from Jones. <clears throat> and this relates to the work of revival and reformation that is going on right now. The church is calling for revival and reformation. And, and Jones makes reference to what Ellen White said. Um, he says, he's quoting her, 
where he, he says the Laodicean message was first given to the church in the 1850s by James White. And he says, but when it was first presented, because it did, didn't do the work in a short time, they said, and he's quoting Ellen White, the time hasn't come. And so they gave up and missed it. And then he reads from Testimonies, Volume 1, page 186. And this is Ellen White now. She says, I saw that this message, the Laodicean message, would not accomplish its work in a few short months. Notice what it's supposed to do. It is, to des- it is designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings and to lead them to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel as this am- message affected the heart, it led to deep humility of God. Angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. So Jones Jones comes to the inescapable conclusion. If the Laodicean message is supposed to help people to be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel's message, then we need to study Revelation 3 verses 14 to 22 to understand what is the message that will fit us for translation in our generation. And notice, it's not going to be done in a few short months. A lot of times we think, you know what? If I just pray long enough and hard enough, the latter rain will come upon me. And I hope you're praying for the latter rain. I need to do more of that myself. But it's not going to be just a few short months. What we need is to repent from our backsliding, to have not only revival, but reformation. And that message in Revelation 3, 14 through 22, is designed to do that. Now, notice also, and that, so that's what the message was that God sent through Jones and Wagner, because Ellen White said their message was the message to the Laodicean church. And we didn't receive it. Now, what does the Laodicean message have to do with the shaking? This is a famous quote, Early Writings, page 270. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. And you know, a lot of times as as I've come through um, this message of the third angel, I'll hear people that say, we need to give the straight testimony, and they say it just like that. (laughs) And you know what Ellen White defines as the straight testimony? The counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean church which means the straight testimony is found in Revelation 3, 14 through 22. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it make sense if we wanted to give the straight testimony to study Revelation 3, 14 to 22? Now notice what happens. This message will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. So when people receive the message, they will receive it and they will give the straight truth. Notice what happens. Some will not bear the straight testimony. That's what happened in 1888. They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause the shaking among God's people. So you know what's going to cause the shaking? People are going to study the Laodicean message of Revelation 3, 14 to 22. People who come to its understanding will pour forth the straight truth, and then others will say, no, wait a minute, I don't like that message. Don't give that to me. That's what will cause the shaking among God's people. I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half-heated. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. Now, there's many things that we can say from this, but what I want to do now is let's just go through Revelation 3, 14 to 22. The Laodicean message. Let's let the Bible speak for itself to understand. And I hope that you will see things in a way that you have never seen them before. And because of the interest of time, I am going to um, condense some of my thoughts here. Let's look, starting in verse 14. Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Laodicea means a judged people, and the faithful and true witness, Jesus Christ, is announcing to the judgment hour church a judged people. By the way, I'm creator. So, 
Do you wonder why creation gets attacked in the judgment hour? The faithful and true witness of Christ is being attacked. He is the beginning of creation, the creation of God. He is the creator. And in verse 15, he says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. We know this part. Verse 16, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, <clears throat> we all know, yeah, we're the Laodicean church. We're lukewarm. We just need to get more on fire for Jesus. Amen. That's true. But there's, there's a lot more to it than that in reality. First of all, when it says Jesus will spew the Laodiceans out of his mouth, the word spew, of course, means to vomit, which means that the Laodicean condition is nauseating to Christ. Have you ever thought about the possibility that your spiritual condition could be nauseating to your Savior? That's sobering. Now, why is it that Laodicea is nauseating to Christ? And verse, it begins in verse 17, and this is where, you know, in my work as a physician, and there are other physicians that are here, the worst thing you could do to a patient is to give them an inaccurate diagnosis. And say, someone comes in with cancer, and they come through, and you say, have good news for you, you have a clean bill of health. Does that make that true? No, you just haven't told them the truth. So Jesus, who knows our true spiritual condition, he's telling us what we are really like. And he says, because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, there may be some people in the Seventh-day Adventist church, in the Laodicean church, who are in their Laodicean condition because they have so much money that it causes them to lose their love for God. That may be true of even perhaps some of you here in this room. But let's be real here. How many Seventh-day Adventists are so rich that it's caused them to lose their walk with God? I guess you could say Americans are in some respects, but is Jesus really talking about literal money here? Or is he talking about something different here? He's actually talking about being spiritually rich. He's talking about being spiritually increased with goods. And if you look carefully in Scripture, and this is where I'm just going to con condense things for the interest of time, to be rich, and you can find this in the book of 1 Peter and the book of James, to be rich is to have faith. So if you say, I am rich and increased with goods, I don't need anything else, you are saying, praise the Lord, I have faith. I am rich in faith. I have saving faith. I have righteousness by faith, and I don't need anything else. And Jesus says, no, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And if you are naked, you don't have the covering of Christ's righteousness, which means you don't have his righteousness at all. And Remember what I quoted earlier today about Seventh-day Adventists? 63% say they have an intimate relationship with Christ. 73% say they have assurance of salvation. And 33% spend time with Christ every day. 33%. You know what has happened to the Seventh-day Adventist church? The thing that has become all in all, and you can see it, is assurance of salvation. What we want to know is, as long as I have assurance of salvation, nothing else matters. You can believe what you want to believe. I'll believe what I want to believe. And as long as I have assurance of salvation, I'm good. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. And I don't need anything else. Praise the Lord. I have salvation. Does that sound like our church today? We're, we think that we have saving faith. We think we have righteousness by faith, that we don't need anything else, and we're actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So the question is, why do we have that experience? Well, Jesus gives us the answer. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's our condition. This word wretched 
And I know when I was here at Advent Hope before I preached a whole sermon on this, this was, wow, over three years ago. So some of you may have not been here. The word wretched comes from the Greek word taliiparos, and it's found one other place in Scripture, which is Romans 7, where Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is the man of Romans 7 who in verse 14 says, I am carnal, sold under sin. Meaning, if you are sold under sin, you are a slave to sin. And in Romans 6, you are either slaves to righteousness or slaves to sin. Romans 7 shows you what it means to be a slave to sin. You do the things you don't want to do, and you don't do the things you want to do, and Later on in the chapter, it says that you are brought into captivity to the law of sin and death. Because when you are a slave, you can't do the things that you want to do. Your slave master tells you what to do. So the man of Romans 7 knows in his mind, there's the law of God. I want to keep it. I want to follow Christ. But the good that he wants to do, he doesn't do. And the things that he doesn't want to do, he does. O wretched man, who shall deliver me? Now, at least the man of Romans 7 knows that this is a bad place to be. But guess what Laodicea thinks? And you've heard this, because I've heard this in our pulpits. Our pastors, many of them teach us, Romans 7 shows that as long as we are here on this earth, we will just keep sinning and falling over and over again. But I praise God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that that is the experience of righteousness by faith. I have assurance of salvation. I just keep sinning and falling over and over again, just like the man of Romans 7. And so praise the Lord. That is my experience on the way to heaven. Now let me ask you this. If you're convinced that you can have that kind of an experience and have salvation, that you have salvation, you have assurance in Christ, you have the experience of Romans 7, of sinning over and over and never getting victory, but you know that I'm still saved, then when the message of the true witness to the Laodiceans comes and pierces you straight into the heart and says, you are not saved. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, meaning you do not have my righteousness. The effect it has that it will have on our people will be, some will accept it. They will rise forth and they will pour forth the straight testimony with power. And others who enjoy their carnal existence will say, don't tell me that I'm wretched. Don't tell me that the Romans 7 experience is going to lead me to eternal death. I don't want to hear that. What I want to hear is that Jesus loves me and will save me in my sins no matter what. And that is what leads to the shaking in Adventism. And... Our acceptance of Romans 7 as being part of the gospel is a prophetic fulfillment of Christ describing our condition. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through everything else. I will mention that to be miserable, that word is found only in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable and Christ is saying to Laodicea, the reason you are miserable is because you have this false assurance of salvation where you think you have hope of Christ that will give you eternal life, but in reality it's a false hope that is only for the present life and you're going to find out that you were on the wrong side. And again, people are going to say, don't tell me that. I know that I have salvation. I know that I keep sinning and falling over and over again, but Jesus will just cover me even though I keep on sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. And this is the message that Jones and Wagner brought to the Laodicean, or to, yeah, to the Laodicean church, to the Adventist church in 1888. They taught that Christ was to be in us that he could give us the power to live his life here on this earth and that we would be living demonstrations of his character to the world. You see, this concept of assurance of salvation, and it's it's good to have confidence in our walk with Christ, but it has to be based on reality, not error. 
That, you know, having confidence of salvation is fine as long as it's grounded in truth. Although Ellen White actually says we should never say that we have assurance of salvation because we must die every day. And if you say, I'm saved, I'm saved, it tends to lessen your commitment to dying to self every day. It's a daily process. And so <clears throat> what we need is to get away from this model of basing everything on, a, of, on assurance of salvation and go back to the message that Jones and Wagner brought in 1888. You know what they taught? They taught that the most important thing was the vindication of God's character to the universe. They taught that assurance of salvation is secondary or immaterial to, to me allowing God to pour out His Spirit through me so that I will rightly represent His name to the world. And those are the kind of people that Jesus is going to save. The people who care about the glory and honor of His name much more so than the, the assurance of their own salvation. Because here's what happens when we get trapped in this trap of assurance of, assurance of, eternal, of, uh, assurance of salvation. Here's what we say. An issue comes up and we say, is this a salvational issue or is it not? <laughs> and inevitably, we, when we ask that question, when we come to our decision about whether it's salvational or not, we are going to choose the lower standard. Are we not? Yes. So is it a salvational issue? Oh, well, nah. God loves me. I'm saved anyway. I have assurance. Um, and so then the standard gets lowered. And we're not asking the right question because the question we should be asking when an issue comes to the table is, will my decision bring honor and glory to God's name before the universe? And instead, we're just, like, we're just selfishly concerned about our own salvation. But the people that Jesus is going to save are the people that love him so much because of his sacrifice for them that they will do anything. They will love their lives unto the death. They will do anything to vindicate God's name before the universe through his grace and power. Amen. And that was the 1888 message. Now, again, my time is limited, but I'll say this. There has been an effort to define the 1888 message, and there are certain teachings that have come into certain groups that really are hard to square with Scripture. For example, they have tried to paint a picture that Jones and Wagner were teaching that we were all justified and saved automatically on the cross already, and that salvation just consists in accepting that fact, and, and so it's easier to be saved than to be lost, and that kind of thing. And while it is true that we receive salvation at the cross, Psalms 86, 5, for example, teaches that the Lord is good and ready to forgive. He's ready to forgive us. But it wasn't automa it's not automatic. It wasn't already there until we respond to the drawing that he is giving to us. So that's probably one of the main issues. Um, and, and interestingly enough, this same group, one of their leading um, teachers, and I'm trying to be sensitive here, he teaches that the Romans 7 experience is the experience of salvation on the way to heaven. So unfortunately, you have a group of people who want to understand the 1888 message better, and yet they come to Romans 7 and they get it wrong. And so the real message in 1888 was all about Christ living out his lives his life through the lives of his people so that we would demonstrate his character to the world. Now, I'm going to read you a few other <clears throat> quotes from Jones and Wagner that make it crystal clear what they taught. Actually, before I do that, <clears throat> I think it would be useful for me to deal with the issue of justification by faith this is a little bit of theology, but um, there's, a, there's this debate in the church over whether justification, is it, does it declare you righteous only or does it make you righteous also? The way I'm first going to explain this is actually 
simple English. I'm going to write a few words down. The first word here is pacify. The second word here is verify. The third word here is purify. And let's just define what these words mean. To pacify means to make peace, right? To verify means to make sure. To purify means to make pure, yet Christians teach that to justify means to declare righteous only. Let's write this word down. Justify. Justify, by its very definition in English, means to make righteous or to make just. It's God's work in making man just. That's just simple English here. And people, Desmond Ford, when he was here in Loma Linda a couple of years ago, says, the scholars all agree that to be justified is to be declared righteous only. Well, I can, I can give you a few scholars that disagree with Des Ford on that, but I'll, I'll withhold the names for now. Anyway, let's look, though, at what Ellen White says. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1098. By... By receiving his imputed righteousness through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we become like him. So imputed righteousness, that's justification. We become like him. And this is even clear. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 394. In ourselves we are sinners, but in Christ we are righteous. Now notice this. This is the key. Having made us righteous. Having what? Having made us righteousness through the imputed righteousness of Christ. The imputed righteousness of Christ is justification. Everybody agrees with that. Imputed righteousness is justification. Imparted righteousness is sanctification. And Ellen White is saying, having made us righteous through the imputed righteousness of Christ, God pronounces us just. And E.J. Wagner says in his book, Christ and His Righteousness, to justify means to make righteous. So in 1888... And with Ellen White, they taught that to be justified is to be made righteous by Christ. And here's the point. If you are made righteous, you are righteous. But what many Christians teach today is that if you are justified, you are declared righteous only, but you really aren't living a completely righteous life. Christ simply covers you. You continue to sin, just like the man of Romans 7, and that is what they say is justification by faith. But what Jones and Wagner taught about justification by faith was we are made righteous. Ellen White says to be justified is to be made righteous. So there is a disconnect here, and Christ the great physician, the true witness to the Laodicean church is telling Laodicea, you think you have assurance of salvation. You think you have righteousness by faith, but you are naked because you are wretched, because you have the experience of Romans 7 and you need to be zealous and repent. Now, <clears throat> notice what Jones and Wagner said. and they, I've read these quotes in several sermons, so you may have heard this before. This, these are statements by Jones and Wagner. In all of our Christian experience, we have left little loopholes along here and there for sin. We have never dared to come to that place where we would believe that the Christian life should be a sinless life. We have not dared to believe it or preach it, but in that case, we cannot preach the law of God fully. Why not? Because we do not understand the power of justification by faith. Wagner equates justification by faith with sinless living. Now, how often do you hear that preached in the Seventh-day Adventist church? That's going to bring a shaking, I guarantee you. Because people say, oh yeah, justification is just a legal declaration with no change. And this is Jones. Christ is to be in us just as God was in him. And his character is to be in us just as God was in him. It is the cooperation of the divine and the human, the mystery of God in you and me. That is the third angel's message. Here's Jones, 1895 General Conference. In Jesus Christ, as he was in sinful flesh, 
God has demonstrated before the universe that he can so take possession of sinful flesh as to manifest his own presence, his power, and his glory instead of sin manifesting itself. Then God will so take us and so use us that our sinful selves shall not appear to influence or affect anybody, but God will manifest his righteous self, his glory before men in spite of all of ourselves and our sinfulness. And that is the mystery of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory, God manifest in sinful flesh. And right there, you can see that in the 1888 message, the messengers taught that Christ took our human nature and thereby gives us an example of how to live that same life here on this earth. And unfortunately, the issue of the nature of Christ is like a, a taboo to topic now because people fight so fiercely over it. But if you read the Bible, the spirit of prophecy in its totality, and you see that Ellen White never wrote a letter to Jones and Wagner condemning them for their view of the fallen nature of Christ. She wrote a letter to Baker, who as best as we can tell was teaching a view of adoptionism, that Christ actually sinned and then was adopted into be becoming the Son of God. That's the error that she was co combating in the error uh, of the Baker letter where she says, don't set him among the people as one like ourselves, someone who had sinned. Now, continuing on, this is Jones, the consecrated way to Christian perfection. Perfection, perfection of character is the Christian goal. Perfection attained in human flesh, our flesh, in this world. Christ attained it in human flesh in this world and thus made and consecrated a way by which in him every believer can attain it. Amen. And then Wagner, 1901. But before probation ends, there will be a people so complete in him that in spite of their sinful flesh, they will live sinless lives. They will live sinless lives in mortal flesh because he who has demonstrated that he has power over all flesh lives in them, lives a sinless life in sinful flesh. My brothers and sisters, that is the message to the Laodicean church. And you know... We as a people have been here for a long time now, since 1888. And there's been different remedies suggested. Others have revised history to say that 1888 was the great turning point in which the church has been on a victorious path ever since. And yet the reality of it is, according to Christ, the faithful and true witness, that our religious condition is nauseating to him that we are wretched, that we have the experience of Romans 7 that causes us to be miserable, poor, blind, and naked without the righteousness of Christ. And so he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And the question I have to you today is, are you willing to take the rebuke and chastening of the Lord? And Jesus goes on to say in the message to Laodicea, he he gives us this wonderful promise after rebuking us. He goes through all these things. Well, and he tells us to buy gold tried in the fire. Ellen White tells us the gold is faith and love, and you can prove that from Scripture as well, that you may be rich. That's why First Peter talks about the fiery trials that we must pass through. He tells us to buy white raiment so that we will be clothed. And he says, as many as I love are rebuke and chasten. And I notice verses 20 and 21. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If Jesus is standing at the door and knocking, where does that put him in relation to us? He's on the outside of Laodicea. That's a harsh reality. We claim to be the remnant, those entrusted with a third angel's message to give to the world with a loud voice, and yet we've left Christ out of the, out of the hearts of our lives. And then we wonder why Christ would give us such a harsh assessment of our religious experience that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know, it's really simple. Christ comes in, sin goes out. Sin comes in, Christ goes out. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice 
and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And notice verse 21. This is the message to the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church who says, praise the Lord. I have assurance of salvation. I have righteousness by faith because I have the experience of being declared just by Christ, even though I sin over and over again. At least I have assurance of eternal salvation. And at least I don't have to worry about overcoming sin in this life. And then notice what Jesus says in verse 21 to Laodicea. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Can you see how that connects with what I just read from Jones and Wagner? Christ is saying, I overcame in human flesh in this world, and you can overcome just as I did. And if you do, you will sit with me on the throne. That is the message to the Laodicean church. Now, I have a couple of quotes that I want to show you. So notice what happens. Early writings, this is where we read about the shaking. This is page 271 from the same quote. Ellen White says, I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. These are the people who received the straight testimony from the council of the true witness to the Laodicean church. They now had a change. They had received great power, the latter rain, which enabled them to give the loud cry of the third angel. And brothers and sisters, I want to be part of that. I want to live to be part of the loud cry and the latter rain. And then in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 187, this is from a chapter entitled The Laodicean Church. Notice what Ellen White says. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness. It gets better, but hang on. Notice what's happened. People have been tested on every point. This is a testing message. We stand every test. We overcome. Be the price what it may. Have heeded the counsel of the true witness. And notice, they will receive the latter rain and thus be fitted for translation. The Laodicean message of Revelation 3, 14 to 22 is a translation message. And the reason why we haven't been translated yet is because we have the experience of Romans 7. We are satisfied with it. We think that we have assurance of salvation based on false premises that God will declare us righteous even when we're really not. And we're actually saying that we will make God a liar. God does not lie. He will not declare you righteous unless He has made you righteous. Amen. Amen. And so what we need as a people is to come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price of what it may. And, you know, I may step on a few toes now, but if that's the case, it's done out of love, not out of anything else. There are many points for each one of us, and I'm speaking to myself, where we're not willing to, to pay the price whatever it takes We're not willing to heed the counsel of the true witness. And so the Lord comes to us and he gives us clear counsel from inspiration, such as whatsoever things are pure and lovely, think on these things. And yet we set that aside and we say, oh, you know, it's okay to go to the movies every once in a while. And I don't even go to the theater. I just watch them in my home. I know there's a little bit of immorality there, but, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm mature enough to be able to handle that. Or, you know, um, everybody else in the church is watching the Super Bowl, so why don't we have a Super Bowl party at our church? Let's get together, have some pizza and popcorn, and let's cheer on our team as they tear each other down with the most intense competitive spirit possible. And let's be honest here, and and I can say this because sports has been an issue in my life. Sports is not bringing glory to God. 
It's all about human pride, the elevation of one team over the other or one person over the other. It's about the glorification of man. And the 1888 message of justification by faith is about laying the glory of man in the dust. How does watching sports help you to lay the glory of man in the dust? All it does is create within you the spirit of competition and pride. And you know, We've reached a time in our church where we need to see some high places torn down. Like it was in the days of the children of Israel, the righteous kings weren't willing to tear down the high places because they were the sacred cows. You would have caused too much opposition. But the Lord is looking for people to come with the love of Christ, with a straight message that will convict hearts, where we will see Jesus on the cross, as I talked about earlier today. When we see Jesus on the cross looking down on us and his eyes reach us, are we going to say, Lord, I know you gave up everything in heaven for me, but I just can't give up sports. Or I can't give up my jewelry, or I can't give up my makeup, or I can't give up my meat, or I can't do this. That's just too much. I need to fit in enough with this world. Where, where are we going as a church? Really, where are we? Are we willing to give everything to Christ? Are we willing to receive the counsel of the straight testimony of the true witness to the Laodicean church? And don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating that you all go out here now and start pointing fingers and slamming people over the head saying, see, see what you're doing wrong? I mean, Norman was just saying this and you're doing that. No, I'm talking about you personally examining your own heart and looking Jesus in the eye on the cross. And if you can imagine Jesus on the cross and you see him hanging there, the blood coming down, and you see the look of love in his eyes because he knew you would be lost if he didn't do that, are you, what, what are you willing to hang on to? Mm. Name me one thing you're willing to hang on to. And by the grace of God, when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ completely, Christ will come into us. He will help us to be surrendered to Him so that when we come up to each point, something new will come and we'll say, oh, you know what, I hadn't seen that in the spirit of prophecy before. Praise the Lord for revealing this to me. I'll give that up now too. We come up to every point, stand every test, be the price what it may. And by the grace of God, we will be fitted for translation. And, you know, I, I just challenge you here at Advent Hope. I mean, I never know when I may be back or not. You know, maybe Jesus will, will, will come before I see some of you again. And if that was in the next year, praise the Lord. But I challenge you here. Hold the standard high. Don't buy into the argument that in order to do evangelism effectively, we must lower the standard to reach people where they are. It is true that Jesus reaches people where they are, but we don't compromise truth to reach people. We hold the standard of truth high, and when we share our message in a loving way, God will bless us. And I challenge each one of you here, <clears throat> don't take the, the messages that you've heard today and think about all the other people that should have been here. I challenge you to go home today and look Jesus in the eye and ask Him to reveal to you what things are in your life that are preventing Him from pouring out His latter rain power on you. Because God designed that we should have gone home a long time ago. We shouldn't be here in 2011. And... If you think about what our message really is, our message is a message of termination. It's a message that will put us as a church out of business, so to speak. Because when we do our work, then we'll be translated and then we will be with the saints from all ages and there's not going to be such a thing as the, the, the pre-cross church and the Seventh-day Adventist church. We are all going to be saints in heaven. We have a message to put our church out of business. And until that time, Christ is going to continue to send appeals like he did through the General Conference, calling us back to revival and reformation. And as I said earlier, 
To be revived is to acknowledge that we are spiritually dead because to revive is to bring back to life. We as the Laodicean church, we are spiritually dead. It is crystal clear. That is why Jesus has not come. Sure, there have been saints in isolated pockets here and there, and there always have been. But we as a church, we have been part of that Laodicean spirit. And I'm not just talking about people that are out there that don't even believe in the fundamental beliefs of our church anymore. I'm talking about us who know the truth and we're not living it. So I just challenge you today that... And I challenge myself that we would heed the counsel of the true witness, that we would hear the voice of Jesus speaking, us, speaking to us today, that we would surrender everything in our lives, whatever high places there may be that are left in our hearts, that we would surrender everything so that Christ will do his work here in Loma Linda of pouring out the latter rain. And... I'm going to make an appeal at this time. I'll make this short. We need to wrap up. But if there is anyone here today who would like to come down to the front, and this may not be for everyone. This is, for, this is a specific appeal. And this is for Jesus. It's for no one else. You know that there are things in your life, sins in your life, that are preventing Jesus from pouring out His Holy Spirit upon you. And I'm speaking to myself. And when, instead of saying, oh yeah, all those other people are delaying the return of Christ, I realize I am delaying the return of Christ. And you say, Lord, I want to give my life to you completely. Please help me in those areas that I'm struggling in. I invite you to come down to the front. We're going to have a special prayer. If there's one or two... It's time for us as a church to humble ourselves before the Lord. And some of you after this meeting may need to go to some other people in this room or elsewhere and say, you know what, I am so sorry. I have had a wrong spirit towards you. We don't want to be like that letter in Testimonies Volume 8 where Ellen White saw what might have been. We want to be the generation that history will look out throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity and say, this was the generation that decided to become crucified with Christ. This was the generation that decided to heed the counsel of the true witness. This was the generation that decided that enough is enough with this world, with the attractions and lusts and cares of this life, that I am giving everything to Jesus no matter what all the time by his grace i'm thankful to see so many of you that have come forward and i know that god is is moving as we see the latter rain the the appeal for revival and reformation and the call for the latter rain i just challenge each one of you remember this work isn't going to be accomplished in a few short months we need patience that's why it's the patience of the saints we need persistence that we will push through. I really believe that the Holy Spirit is moving and I really believe that if each one of us here takes this challenge seriously, we will see Jesus come in this generation. But we have to, by the grace of God, every day surrender to Jesus 100% and come up to every point, stand every test, be the price what it may. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for each person that is here, for the decisions that have been made, for how you have spoken to us today. I thank you for the message that you sent to this church so long ago and that you are trying to bring back again in clear, distinct rays and that revival and reformation are stirring in the hearts of your people. And I pray for each one of us here that we would allow nothing to stand in the way of Christ in our hearts, that we would allow Jesus to come in. And on that great and glorious day, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, may we be among the 144,000, the last generation here on this earth, 
who are alive to see Jesus come in the clouds. And when he comes, we will say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. And we will be able to live with him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. May we have that experience. Forgive us for our laity and stupor, our wretchedness, our miserable condition of being poor, blind, and naked. May we zealously repent each and every day from this day forward, and may we demonstrate your character to the world everywhere we go. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. It's been a privilege to be back at Advent Hope, and I pray that the Lord will bless this ministry to accomplish the work that God has designed that it should. And may we meet in heaven someday soon. Amen.